This is Don Pringle bringing you this week's edition of the United Nations Review. Cold War issues were prominent in the discussions of the General Assembly as it concluded its third week. Later in the program, we'll talk with the presiding officer of the 17th session, Mohammad Zafullah Khan of Pakistan. While disarmament and nuclear testing will be treated in full detail in the Assembly's political committee when it meets after the general debate, many foreign ministers stress the importance of these subjects in their opening policy addresses. Lord Hume of Great Britain called for a more active use of the processes of conciliation and urged an early demise of the Cold War. It is degrading beyond words that in these days the peace should depend on the balance of, the balance of terror, but it is better than destruction. And therefore, we must disturb, uh, decide at once not to disturb the balance of power, but to work with all our being so that we may base our relationship on the much more solid foundation of interdependence. There, in spite of outward appearances, very slowly, but I think perceptibly, the Cold War is beginning to thaw. And East-West relations, in spite of appearances, are starting to get a little better. The momentum, once it is started, will not be reversed. If imperialism is thrown out of the window on the wind of change, so is Karl Marx and good riddance too. In this, um, this sterile business of charge and counter charge is a waste of energy and talent and wealth when we all ought to be working for the betterment of man. So long as the free world, Mr. President, is attacked, we must respond and we shall never go under. But Britain wants to join others in burying the, the Cold War, in getting ahead with the modern political order where men want to live. One of the speakers who did not agree with Lord Hume's opinion that East-West differences were narrowing was Adam Rapatsky, the foreign minister of Poland. He believed that the United Nations presented man's best hope for peace, provided only that the Western powers, as he said, cease their Cold War policy. It is true the world of today is divided, in some respects to a greater extent than ever before, but also more than at any time in the past it is bound by the general common interest in survival in avoidance of a nuclear catastrophe. We in Poland are convinced that at the present time, when major decisions must be taken, our organization is more needed than ever before. It will fulfill its responsible tasks if, first of all, it rids itself of the remnants of a period when only too often it was used as an instrument of policy by a well-defined group of states which followed the policy of the Cold War. The United Nations will fulfill its proper role only if it becomes a meeting place, a place for discussion, agreement and cooperation in the interests of all and in the interests of peace. To many of the smaller nations, now a numerical majority in the UN, Cold War questions often boil down to a single word disarmament. Delegates of these countries press vigorously for an end to nuclear testing, for a removal of the threat of nuclear holocaust. And delegates from Asia, Latin America and Africa believe that their best hope of getting development money lies in a reduction of the armament spending of the major powers. These themes they repeatedly stress in the general debate. Although disarmament negotiations... In the the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ethiopia Atto Katima Yifru urged the immediate cessation of nuclear testing. He suggested a resumption of the Geneva negotiations on the basis of a joint memorandum submitted by non-nuclear participants. Milko Tarabanov, Bulgaria's foreign minister, supported Soviet disarmament proposals, warned that the balance of power in the world has changed, with the United States no longer enjoying an atomic monopoly. But it continues, he said, to obstruct progress in this field. The United Arab Republic representative, Mahmoud Fazi, cited the halting of nuclear testing as still the best hope for progress towards full disarmament. He stated that the differences between East and West appeared narrower than ever before and stressed the role of the non-aligned countries in disarmament negotiations. Dr. Marcos Briseño of Venezuela 
said that the world was going through one of its gravest crises and urged that disputes be settled by negotiation and by international law. The foreign minister of Mali, Parema Bokum, told the assembly of the need to stop weapons testing. By bringing the arms race to a halt, he said, the great powers could divert resources now used for armaments to aid the poorer nations of the world. Hungarian Foreign Minister Janos Pater said that the world faced the choice of peaceful coexistence among different political systems or marching together towards a thermonuclear holocaust. A former president of the assembly, Paul Henri Spock of Belgium, declared that the common market was a potent force in the world, that its forces would contribute to a major relaxation of Cold War tensions. He denied vigorously the Soviet charge that the common market was an aggressive base for NATO. Sudan's foreign minister, Ahmed Kayir, declared that little or no progress had been made towards general and complete disarmament, and that perhaps more attention should be paid to areas like the Congo, on which the success or failure of the United Nations itself depended. One problem on which there is strong controversy in the United Nations is the financial crisis of the organization, incurred through peacekeeping operations in the Middle East and the Congo. A number of nations have refused to contribute to the costs of these operations. An advisory opinion handed down recently by the International Court of Justice has declared that budgets for such operations be met collectively by all states. We had an opportunity the other day to discuss this question with a prominent Asian jurist. Mohammed Safullah Khan of Pakistan, who is the president of this 17th session. We asked him what influence the advisory opinion of the court might have on a decision by the General Assembly. Well, in the first place, the General Assembly will have to pronounce itself upon the uh, advisory opinion. Uh, my own view is that, uh, though of course the advisory opinion is what its name indicates, uh, it is not a judgment in a contentious case between two parties. It's an opinion handed down by the court as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations um, defining the legal position. Uh, uh, but it has also always been my opinion also that once the uh, any organ of the United Nations or any of the specialist agencies ask the opinion to hand down an advisory opinion, ask the court to hand down an uh, advisory opinion, uh, that opinion may not be strictly uh, in the letter of the law binding, but it is uh, morally binding upon the organization, whatever attitude any particular member of the organization might take up. Uh, with respect to this opinion, uh, the matter is down on the agenda. My feeling is, I have not taken any count and so on, but my feeling is that uh, the opinion will be endorsed uh, by a majority of the, and I think the requisite majority, the two-thirds majority uh, of the membership. Uh, what its effect may be upon uh, the states that are directly affected, those who have hitherto refused to bear their share of the cost of the operations in the Middle Eastern and the Congo, it's more difficult to assess. Uh, I'm hoping that if uh, the assembly would begin to see an end of the operations in the Congo, that a settlement was uh, reached and was being put into effect, uh, that might uh, help a lot to resolve this uh, problem of the outstanding contributions. Mm, the states concerned then might reconcile themselves to the position, well, all right, the thing is being wound up and now and we had mm. taken up this mm, mm, position on principle, but we can now go ahead and uh, make our contribution. Uh, a good deal would depend upon how the discussion goes on the advisory opinion itself. Uh, again, my own personal view is with regard not only to this advisory opinion, but with regard to all advisory opinions requested of the court and which the court has handed down, that the organization, as I have said, whether it is legally bound or not, is morally bound to accept them and to give effect to them. Uh, if on any single occasion the organization should take the view, well, this is an opinion, but we are not going to accept it, 
the court will uh, thereafter refuse to hand down opinions. They'll say, well, thank you. We uh, are not willing to embark upon a purely academic exercise. Mm -hmm. Now, having in mind, sir, your wide experience for 15 or 16 years in the United Nations Assembly and its councils, and committees, we may be excused, I hope, for asking you a very general question. What do you think of the influence of the United Nations as compared to its beginnings? And how do you see today the role of the General Assembly? Well, of course, it's uh, patent that today the United uh, Nations is much more representative um, in its membership than it was in the beginning. Uh, there are, uh, as uh, we are all aware, 108 members today as compared with the original 50. And uh, next week will be 109, and I believe in the week following will be 110. Uh, therefore, it's, it's uh, approaching uh, universality. It already possesses almost near universality. Uh, on the other hand, the Security Council, where uh, people have repeatedly met with frustrations over various problems, uh, does not today carry the same weight as it did in the beginning and as it was intended by the framers of the Charter to carry. Uh, consequently, therefore, the uh, other organ of the United Nations which discusses general questions and so on, the Assembly has risen in uh, stature, not only in size, but in its authority. It is true that technically the uh, Assembly has no more authority today than it had in the beginning because it can only act within the authority conferred upon it by the words of the Charter. But the content of that authority has become wider and, uh, and uh, stronger. Um, also, the increased representation has uh, uh, resulted in emphasis shifting from some problems and uh, uh, other problems gaining more emphasis and also greater tempo. Uh, that was natural with uh, the beginnings of the United Nations organization with the membership confined almost uh, entirely to uh, East Europe, Western Europe, Latin America, North America, and a few Asiatic and only one or two African states, the emphasis was different. Now, with uh, almost half the membership from Africa and Asia, and mainly from countries who have recently achieved their independence, the emphasis are shifting. The emphasis is a great deal upon still on decolonialism, which is uh, a, a problem that is uh, uh, and though it has stemmed some very hard cases ahead, but it's a problem that is resolving itself, in the process of resolving itself. But a problem that will last much longer is uh, the economic um, improvement of conditions in the developing or the underdeveloped uh, countries. Uh, it was natural that that should be so. The assembly is more and more the center of interest now. The United Nations General Assembly 108 points of view on the world's past, present, and future. Next week, a new nation, Algeria, joins the UN, and President Dortikos of Cuba will address the General Assembly. This is Don Pringle at the United Nations. This is National Educational Television.